Hi, everybody. My name is Lauren Weston. I am the executive director of Actera Action for a Healthy Planet. I am thrilled to have our guest speaker today, Vanessa Moreland. She's joining us from EV Noir. And I am thrilled about her speaking because I think we can all learn something very crucial about access and equity from Vanessa today. I'm also going to share a little bit of information about some upcoming programming that we have. And I'm also admitting everyone while I'm talking. So if I seem a little bit distracted, it's because I'm having folks join us as I'm talking. Quick update on our programming. For some of you um, that are familiar with Actera, you'll recognize us as an education and outreach organization. We have been doing education and outreach programming for 52 years now. Our core programming in this regard right now is our public lecture series, which is bringing you here today, and our Youth Be the Change program, which is a student-based curricula that happens inside the classroom for sixth to eighth graders. And we're focused on climate change curriculum that supports their education and empowerment, giving them uh, the skills that they need to make really thoughtful climate-based decisions in their own lives for their families, hopefully in their communities. We also do beneficial electrification programming, which currently exists with our Carl Knapp Go EV program. If you've ever been um, at one of our expos or met any of our EV ambassadors, you know how successful that program can be in convincing folks to adopt electric vehicles. We've done more this year about mobility as well. And it's really great to see folks thinking about how they get around um, and expressing more ways of um, supporting transit that is also equitable, which you'll see in today's conversation. We also do our Green at Home series, which uh, has many facets to it. We do a series around induction cooking. We do a series around heat pump water heaters, solar EV charging. We also have a monthly cooking class that we do that focuses on um, plant forward recipes, as well as induction cooking. We try to combine the two, which is really exciting. I hope all of you have a chance to experience some of our other programming. Our series this fall is on transportation electrification in the Bay Area. Today, you're experiencing our EVs for equity conversation, but please stay tuned for more information about our October 13th panel on mass mobility fleets and innovation, as well as our November 10th um, webinar on the global future of electrified mobility. Here you'll see a slide about our upcoming lecture in October. I hope you'll register for this. You can find it at our lecture site on the website or on our events page. This is going to be a really interesting panel on where mobility is taking us, what innovations are happening in the space, and how do we electrify fleets. We've got some amazing speakers joining us for next month's panel, so please register for that. We also have some really great upcoming events. Our next one is our Green at Home workshop. Uh, we have an EV charging part of our series. It's September 28th at 7 p.m. We want you to come and learn about home and public electric vehicle charging, any rebates that are here locally and tips to optimize your charging experience. We've got some amazing sponsors of that event, including City of Palo Alto, and we've got speakers from PG&E, and this is part of the National Drive Electric Week. We hope to see you there. We also have our Carl Knapp Go EV workshop called Goodbye Gas, Hello EVs on October 3rd at 4 p.m. Again, please register through our website. Plant-based cooking, which I mentioned before, we use plant-based uh, recipes on induction with our resident chef, Kelvin Briggs. Uh, he's fantastic and does some amazing recipes that I have also enjoyed. Um, my toddler loves coming to these classes. If you are ever interested in learning about plant-based recipes, please join us. We also have our Young Professionals Group, a DIY cleaning products workshop happening September 23rd. September is going to be a busy month for us folks, so please make sure you have these registered and scheduled on your calendar. I am having the end of the month a coffee chat with Dr. Alex Canara, an amazing, <laughs> very uh, wise engineer and physicist who is an environmental advocate, and I'm looking to learn more from him about his experience and expertise. And then on the 30th, we're doing our fall green team network forum called Reimagining the Workplace. So if you're interested in what's going on in the workplace and how things are shifting around implications for sustainability, please join us. 
We'll be talking about transportation, higher education, and um, more as the guest panelists share their expertise with us. Also, if you have a second, we are doing a very new and exciting um, call to action. We are doing the Climate Action Now app. If you can scan this barcode, I'll also have it up at the end of the event so you can see it. You can also find it on our website. But if you're interested in taking action through your mobile um, capacity, please check this app out. We'd be thrilled to have you join us. We are group number 24. So if you want to attach yourself to Actera, please do so through group 24. Huge thank you to our series underwriters, the Gillilands and the Newkermans. We could not be doing these public lectures without the support of our amazing um, longtime Actarans. We also have support from the Bay Area Air Quality Management District and the Foster. If you've ever um, been to the Foster, please, uh, please definitely send them some love. Um, and if you haven't, please go visit. It's an amazing facility in Palo Alto. We're so grateful for them. And I am thrilled to welcome Vanessa. Um, Vanessa is, uh, I've had the pleasure of spending some time with Vanessa and figuring out the overlapping in our history. We're both UC Davis Aggies. Um, she has a connection to Actera that goes back many, many years. And uh, I get to introduce her, which is great. So Vanessa is the Western States Program Manager for EV Noir which is an award-winning consulting group working to accelerate equitable, cleaner and greener mobility future for all of us. She'll explain more about her work and the work of EV and EV hybrid noir in a second. She brings vast experience in the e-mobility sector, having managed EV equity incentive programs and other e-mobility projects. In addition to being an advocate for equitable e-mobility solutions, she's also a diverse EV driver, which gives her a great perspective about the importance of this work. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to give access to Vanessa to share her screen. Good to Wonderful. See you. Thank you so much. Hi, Vanessa. Welcome. I'm going to mute, but if you need me, just message me. Okay. Wonderful. Um, can you just confirm that you can see the shared screen? Confirmed. Wonderful. Okay. Is the waiting room bar popping up on the shared screen by chance? It is. And I've, I've got them. Okay, cool. Yeah. Sweet. All right. So we can go ahead and get started. Thank you much. Um, or thank you so much for the introduction, Lauren. Really excited to be here participating at the Actera Fall lecture series around transportation electrification. So as Lauren mentioned, I'm Vanessa Moreland. I'm the Western States Program Manager at EV Noir, as well as EV Hybrid Noir. And I will get into some information differentiating are two sides of our org. I am a Bay Area native, born and raised in the South Bay, specifically in Campbell. We've been floating in and out of the East Bay off and on for about six, seven years now. Um, as Lauren mentioned, uh, I studied at UC Davis, specifically environmental policy, analysis, and planning. So really relevant to the work that I do now. And since we are on the topic of transportation, my preferred methods are skateboarding and walking. That photo in black and white is me skating at the Newark Skate Park here in the Bay Area. So now going on to the organization I work for, EV Noir. As Lauren mentioned, we are an award-winning consulting group and our work focuses on e-mobility best practices and e-mobility diversity, equity, inclusion. So we work to advance equitable multimodal e-mobility solutions within electric, connected, shared, and autonomous vehicle technologies. And in doing so, we utilize our human-centric approach and data-driven framework to integrate and amplify e-mobility best practices and e-mobility diversity, equity, and inclusion within the transportation sector. To foster this work, we partner with a range of different entities and orgs, including auto manufacturers, transit authorities, utilities, and government to charging networks, nonprofits, community-based organizations, and rideshare and delivery network companies. Some of our partners are actually on this call today. I see some familiar names. Um, at EV Noir, we envision a world where communities of color and under-resourced communities can easily access clean mobility options that facilitate reductions of toxic emissions in their community, all while growing their personal and community economies 
and helping to address climate change. So our mission is focused around engaging these diverse communities while advocating for solutions that fit their specific needs, all while shifting the narrative to be more inclusive of the diverse populations that we have. So on this slide, we just have an example of some of our partners ranging from nonprofits like Grid Alternatives to utilities like PG&E, the government regulatory side like the Air Resources Board to autonomous vehicle companies like Cruise who will also be participating in this fall lecture series. So you can see we really integrate with a lot of different spaces to advance the transportation electrification journey. So I covered EV Noir. Now I will look at um, covering our second side of our practice, which is EV Hybrid Noir, which is our membership organization of the nation's largest network of Black and Latinx EV drivers and enthusiasts. You can see on this map, there are chapters spread throughout the United States, as well as just concentrations of diverse EV drivers and enthusiasts, such as the ones in Colorado or Minnesota. So what really differentiates the two um, orgs that we have, EV Noir focuses on consulting and research, while EV Hybrid Noir is a nonprofit that focuses more on advocacy and elevating our membership group. And here are just some of our members from across the US. Um, the one here showing Atlanta is actually one of our founders. And with our members, we host meetups and invite them to existing events like events that Actera puts on. Our member group is also leveraged when we are doing research for EV Noir, using them as focus groups, key informant interviews, and also just connecting them with those looking to access electric vehicles and really get familiar with the technology. So moving on to the content of today's discussion, which is transportation electrification, we need to first set the stage. So transportation, as we know, allows us to be mobile, whether that's by foot, by bike, skateboard like myself, bus car taking us from point A to point B. However, mobility is much more than bridging two points. Transportation provides access to health centers, education, employment, and having access to these spaces reduces barriers to economic development, residential mobility, and environmental quality. Owning a car and having access to mobility are among the most powerful economic advantages that a US family can have. So if having access to a car or reliable mobility creates economic opportunity, then the lack of access to mobility leads to economic inequities as well as social and environmental inequities. Many social, economic, and environmental inequities are tied to historic destructive policies and practices. Transportation policies have placed highways and other dense transit corridors within diverse black and brown communities, which then divide these communities from higher income neighboring white communities. And this is drastically seen in some areas within the Bay, specifically along the 880 corridor and the 580 corridor, where large trucks are not allowed to go on 580, which passes more through the hills of the Oakland. This then causes concentrated pollution along the 880, where many black and brown residents call home. That was my home area until a couple months ago when I relocated back to the South Bay. Similarly, historic redlining housing policies have prevented individuals and families of color from living in specific areas. This then forces them into undesired areas that lack basic resources like access to fresh food, access to reliable transportation, or schools that are better funded compared to other schools in their area. These destructive transportation and housing qualities have then segmented communities and subsequently called or caused specific communities to be more burdened by higher levels of toxic air pollutants and also have prevented access to economic and social resources. Low income communities of color are three times more likely to breathe dirty air compared to wealthier white communities, which is a drastic disparity. Being exposed to those toxic air pollutants can have serious public health impacts. Short term effects include inflamed asthma, coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath. I can definitely speak to these experiences. I've grown up in the Bay as an asthmatic. Um, just the general pollution here and then the exacerbated pollution from fires over these past years have absolutely impacted 
my daily respiratory health. And then looking at long-term effects, they're far more drastic, including lung cancer, respiratory conditions, as well as cardiovascular disease. So when we look at the map on the right, this is a product of a tool called Callan Viroscreen, which the state uses to um, distribute funding for different environmental justice programs, some of which we will cover later. But the areas in green here have higher incomes and lower levels of pollution. So as green is transitioning to yellow, orange, and then red, the income then is decreasing and pollution is increasing. So this tool again is really utilized by the state to really identify areas that are hardest hit by significant pollution levels, but also under-resourced financially. So again, this tool is a really good um, input for targeting specific funding opportunities that bridge um, environmental improvement technologies or services to communities that have been lacking those connections. I will be pausing to drink some water, that air quality, I definitely feel it today. <laughs> so here we have um, some examples of electric mobility. Traditional forms of transportation, as we know, are generally powered by polluting fuel sources. And this then causes significant air pollution. And as we saw that air pollution then causes various health complications, both short and long-term. And as our anthropogenic footprint continues to grow, it's really important that transportation powered by electricity is integrated because it's a constructive means to reducing transportation emissions while also increasing mobility, accessibility, and reliability to communities. Electric mobility or e-mobility has many forms, which you can see here, and these are just some examples, including e-scooters like the Lyman Bird scooters around the Bay Area, e-buses, electric vehicles that you see driving down the highways, trucks, and more. And these e-mobility options cover the light, medium, and heavy-duty spaces. So for personal use, for moving goods and for hauling um, or hauling goods and people as well. <laughs> These options can also be owned personally or by community networks such as mobility hubs or by traditional fleets such as delivery services. Electrified transportation has been around for some time. It's definitely not a new concept. However, in these past couple of years, it's definitely gaining a lot more momentum as you can see in these two charts here. So the EV market has steadily grown over this past decade and is continuing to do so both domestically and abroad. California having the highest concentration of electric vehicles in the United States. So we're you know, kind of leading by example for the surrounding region and beyond. With that, people of color are the fastest growing consumer segment in the state of California and the US. So this population growth has brought an increase to buying power, making consumers of color a critical segment for accelerating EV adoption. And as we'll see in a couple of slides, California has very ambitious EV goals and transportation electrif electrification goals. So it's very crucial to ensure that we're elevating and including all of our diverse communities so that we can actually achieve those milestones and goals set on our radar. And here are just some quick snapshots of headlines capturing milestones within e-mobility or just movement within the e-mobility space, showing that the space is continuing to grow, that there's a lot of momentum and a lot of innovation still being pushed into e-mobility developments. With this deep history of inequities faced by diverse communities, it's really important that as we transition from traditional polluting modes of transportation to cleaner electric powered transportation, that we ensure these diverse communities are prioritized so that we're not repeating those unfortunate historical inequities. Despite over 635,000 EVs on the road in California, there's still a huge diversity gap in vehicle ownership. Vehicle ownership is really dominated by white and male demographics. This is also seen in the participation in EV incentive programs throughout the state with participation rates and distribution rates of incentives being below 10% for most um, non-white demographics. With more than 
plug-in hybrids, so gas electric and fully electric models on the market. There's clearly options that can fit the various lifestyle needs and support communities with transitioning from gas to electric. So what can we do to improve the transportation electrification journey and make it more representative of diverse communities here in California and beyond our state lines? E-mobility, diversity, equity, inclusion are the pillars needed to elevate all communities as we continue to electrify and to prioritize those that are disproportionately burdened by toxic air pollution and also under-resourced financially from government programs. So what exactly does e-mobility, diversity, equity, inclusion look like? At EVNOR, we define it as the development of a transportation system that increases access to high quality mobility options and making sure that those mobility options are diverse, as well as reducing air pollution and enhancing economic opportunity to all members of the community. And at the bottom of the slide here, there is a framework for how we define diversity within e-mobility hating across race and ethnic groups, frontline underserved communities, rural communities, aging demographics, queer communities, Gen X, Y, and Z, as well as multi-unit residents and those participating in gig work, transit network companies, and delivery network companies. And this definition is continuing to expand as we see more and more communities not incorporated in these conversations as the transportation electrification journey continues forward. So it's really crucial due to these systematic issues that I have mentioned on the previous slides that we really prioritize the underserved and communities of color in policy conversations and development. Correcting current and historical racial, social, and economic justices requires addressing the three main pillars of equity, which are outlined here. First is procedural equity, which requires including the voices of those facing inequity in the design and implementation of solutions. A lot of the time, these communities are bridged after the policy has already been developed, more so on the implementation side. And if you're really trying to have those intentional outcomes, you need to have thoughtful conversations with your community and to really understand what exactly are their needs. Policy makers and decision makers cannot assume that this is a best fit for the community and must really work to understand and include that feedback from start to finish. Second is distributional equity, which requires ensuring those who are disproportionately burdened now actually disproportionately benefit from policies. So leveling out that playing field. And then last is the structural equity piece which requires creating frameworks that promote equitable decision-making. So these three equity pillars must be front and center when developing and implementing e-mobility activities here in California and abroad. So as our e-mobility space continues to grow, there is opportunity to ensure equity is at the forefront of policies and programs. By centering equity, we can bridge the communities burdened by social, environmental, and economic inequities with mobility options that help alleviate those exact inequities. California is the most polluted state and continues to claim that title, not a really cool bragging right, <laughs> with the main contributor being transportation. Transportation electrification can play a significant role in reducing overall pollution and definitely can obviously help reduce its piece of the pie in the whole greenhouse gas emissions portfolio. On average, electric vehicles produce about half the amount of CO2 emissions with grid power, and then that then decreases to about 95% less emissions when it's powered by renewables. Electric vehicles also have a lower life cycle impact when combining the three stages of manufacturing, operation and end life. Manufacturing of EVs can be more resource intensive, but including operation and end of life makes the overall life cycle impact lower than that of a gas car. As well, a lot of ma auto manufacturers are doing research and development to look at ways to make the manufacturing portion less resource intensive to really even out that life cycle impact and get a far, far dip below gas vehicles. 
So shifting away from polluting vehicles can really help California clean up its air while improving public health and environmental well-being. The sales of EVs are projected to increase just under 30% over the next 10 years, illuminating the increase of market share and longevity. These are definitely here to stay. EVs create long-term savings, both by reducing expenses on fuel and with vehicle maintenance. Powering a vehicle by electricity is far cheaper than that of gas, especially lately, as you've seen, the gas prices in the Bay have been hovering between four and a half dollars up to almost five sometimes. And when you're powering with electricity, that ranges anywhere from about a dollar to a dollar and a half to go that same distance on average. And then similarly with maintenance, you're removing a lot of the maintenance requirements. If you're going full electric, you no longer have to do your oil changes. And then just the impact to the vehicle overall is less requiring less overall maintenance for those cars. With less money spent on transportation, that means community members have more monies or more money to save and they can redirect those funds however they may choose to be stimulating their own personal economy or stimulating the economy for their community at large. This pie chart here shows a breakdown of California's 2020 greenhouse gas portfolio. That big chunk at the bottom in blue is the transportation contribution, almost at 40%. And within that, you can see almost about 30% stems directly from passenger vehicles. So this really speaks to the direct role that transitioning to electric vehicles can do and help in reduce California with its greenhouse gas portfolio and cleaning up the air. So what does e-mobility, diversity, equity, and inclusion actually look like? Here it's abbreviated as DEI. So we've segmented this into access to vehicles and then access to charging and have outlined some best practices for each of those. So looking at access to vehicles, one really important example I wanna cover are cash on the hood rebates. And these are a great example of equity best practices because they reduce the overall cost of ownership by applying the financial incentive at the point of sale rather than having the recipient fill out a form, put it in the mail, or submit it um, to the administrator of the program online and wait for that incentive to be reimbursed. In addition to that, it also allows better financing since the rebate is factored into the financing package rather than having it factored in later or just not even factored in at all. An example of a program as such is Clean Cars for All, which is a transit equity program serving the nine counties in the Bay Area actually helped support that program prior to my role at EV Noir. And that is a cash on the hood program that helps people replace older vehicles by providing financial incentives to help them replace that vehicle. Another example is expanding electrification to transit and school buses. These transit methods have planned routes and as such, they're easier to shift away and really plan when that battery needs to be charged, how long that battery will last given that exact route. Some examples of electrified fleets here in the Bay, the Milpitas Unified School District now has over five e-buses in their fleets. And if you look around at a lot of the buses passing through town, some of those are hybrid. And a lot of the transit authorities in the Bay Area are looking to transition those buses to full electric or swap the gas buses over to electric modes for their fleet. And switching over these fleet vehicles have really large public health implications. Children and a lot of vulnerable populations rely on buses regularly to get to point A to point B. With that, by shifting away from these polluting vehicles, there's less pollution going into the air and thus those immediate um, community impacts are seen by reducing the contributions from emissions from those vehicles. Now looking over at the blue side, the charging side, one thing to really note here is diversity in options of charging is very important. Charging is not a one size fits all. E-mobility similarly is not a one size fits all. E-mobility really needs to be curtailed to the needs of the specific community. So chargers need to be accessible and centered in spaces that are readily available and readily used, such as multifamily housing sites, street lights, and power poles. 
so that people can just pull up their vehicle and not have to take on the cost of owning the infrastructure and can really just benefit from the use of the infrastructure. In addition to that, they also need to be accessible when it comes to the payment. Not everyone has the privilege of debit and or credit banking. Alternatives are needed so that cash payers can easily utilize these platforms and benefit from public charging infrastructure. Another important lens of the transportation electrification journey is the workforce side. Diverse and underserved communities not only need to use these technologies, but also contribute to the economies supporting e-mobility advancements. There are jobs available at all levels of education. On average, 75% of green jobs are accessible without a bachelor's degree, showing that this is really easy to get into um, the e-mobility space. That increases even more when you're looking at green collar jobs as 99% of those do not require a bachelor's degree. We have here listed some general areas of e-mobility workforce, those being office operations, technical services, and green collars, with some specific examples listed out for each. And these can fall within the public sector, private sector, and nonprofit spaces. I've worked within public, private, and nonprofit and have hopped around between some of these roles noted on this slide. So there's definitely room for mobility and the ability to leverage experiences into new roles. So some examples of office operations, transportation planners, program administrators, outreach coordinators, looking at technical services, some roles within engineering, both electrical, civil, as well as designers. And then going down towards green collar, looking at vehicle maintenance, charger installations, as well as fleet operations. With the e-mobility um, sphere just continuing to evolve, that inherently means the e-mobility workforce is riding along with that. Many cities around the Bay Area have climate action plans established or are working on climate action plans and or are contributing to clean cities coalitions, meaning that they have agreed upon climate plans and thus jobs to support reaching those goals and maintaining those goals, creating ability for workforce development locally and beyond. Supply chain jobs within the electric transportation sector are projected to reach just under 300,000 workers by 2024, up from about 150,000 in 2019, with that number increasing significantly to about 370,000 in 2025, just showing that there's a lot of momentum in the e-mobility space and a lot of different opportunities for those to plug into the e-mobility space or those looking to transfer into the e-mobility space. Education and prior experience do not limit opportunities. I have many friends and teammates with different backgrounds, some with technical, some with non-technical experience, and they all are able to support and nurture the advancement of e-mobility equity. So as you enter this space, or if you're looking to enter this space, just remember that e-mobility is very integrated. One role or connection can lead to another. As Lauren said, I have connections to Actera prior to this role, as well as to some of the participants here on this call today. So how does this translate into California and the California landscape? Some of you may be familiar that California tends to be at the forefront of environmental regulation, really leading by example. And this is carried over into the mobility space as well as the mobility equity space. So on this slide, we have some of the main transportation goals outlined that are on California's radar. Cutting greenhouse gas emissions to 40% below 1990 levels by 2030, 5 million zero emission vehicles on the road also by 2030, 250,000 EV charging stations by 2025, 100% zero emission vehicle sales within California of new cars by 2035. And similarly, 100% ZEV, so zero emission medium heavy duty vehicles by 2045. And then also just making sure that the um, markets for new and used zero emission vehicles are supported to fulfill these goals outlined here. And noted on the bottom of these slides are two specific funding sources that help 
California reach these goals? The first one is the California Climate Investments, which is a statewide initiative that puts billions of cap and trade dollars to work, reducing greenhouse gas emissions while strengthening the economy and improving public health and the environment. This fund also has a particular lens targeting disadvantaged communities. Some of the programs listed on the next slide are supported by the CCI funding source. Another very common funding source for transportation advancement in California stems from the low carbon fuel standards, which regulates the carbon intensity of fuels supplied to transportation. And the low carbon fuel standards can provide long-term durable funding for EV infrastructure and EV purchasing incentives as other policies um, expire or phased out or as funding sources in other spaces deplete. So here we have some programs um, highlighted within the California e-mobility landscape, many of which are supported by um, those funding sources listed on the last page as well as some additional ones. So on the far left side of this slide, we have the replacement uh, vehicle retire and replacement programs, which serve various um, areas within the state, one of which is Clean Cars for All in the Bay Area, the Clean Cars for number four all, which is in the SAC Romento area, SAC area, and then Drive Clean in the San Joaquin, which is in the San Joaquin Valley, and Replace Your Ride, which is down in Southern California. This program is also expanding to San Diego, and CARB is also looking to expand this to be um, beyond just the air districts with higher levels of vehicle density and pollution to be inclusive of air districts in the state. Um, some additional programs noted here are the Clean Vehicle Assistance Program, which is a statewide grant program. You don't have to trade in a vehicle. You just get financial support to help you purchase a newer used car. Similarly, there's another statewide program called the Clean Vehicle Rebate Project, which provides a rebate following your purchase of a new vehicle. And some of these vehicle programs can be stacked to bring down the overall cost of ownership. So all of those programs just mentioned are for passenger vehicles for single passenger ownership or single ownership of a passenger vehicle. And then looking below at the clean mobility options, this is also a statewide program, but this one is very unique in the fact that it is serving communities rather than specific end users. And this program is really unique in terms of equity such that it is specifically serving community needs. So nonprofits, um, cities, entities within communities applied with specific requests for um, community or e-mobility needs that, specific, that fit their specific community. So for example, the city of Oakland is developing an e-bike library that will be located in deep East Oakland, which is known as a transit desert. And in addition to that, this program will also incorporate workforce development. So it's hitting beyond just bridging people to e-mobility modes, but also supporting the economies elevating those e-mobility modes. And then beyond that, there are programs that are more at regional levels, such as the Peninsula Clean Energy programs that support vehicle purchases or e-bikes, or the e-bike rebate program that is supported through 511 Contra Costa in the East Bay. And then similarly, as you're moving a little bit up north, the Marin Clean Energy Program that also supports vehicle purchases through financial incentives. So before we wrap up and move into the question segment, just want to plug our upcoming town hall that will be on October 1st from 10 to 1130 a.m. And this will be a space for those looking to discuss e-mobility activities within Northern California and learn about e-mobility activities within California, all focused around equity, diversity, and inclusivity. So this is a great way to get acclimated to some activities going on, bridge connections with those participating and leading e-mobility advancements. And with that, I wanna thank you all for 
taking the time to join today and listening to this presentation. And now we can move into questions and discussion. Awesome, Vanessa, thank you so much. We do have some questions already in the chat, so I will filter through them from first to last. Teresa asked, what kind of funding is included in the federal infrastructure package to support equitable transportation investments? And secondarily, how can we get it passed? Sure, so I can speak to um, just some brief kind of themes that are coming from that transportation infrastructure package. There's a lot of funding being directed towards the EVSC infrastructure, so specifically placing chargers in communities. In addition to that, funding will be directed towards workforce development, both in charging and the manufacturing of equipment and vehicles. And then beyond that, they're also exploring um, expanding the federal incentives beyond the tax credit to be something more similar to a cash on hood rebate. So really more um, focusing on the purchase process by making it more equitable by reducing that initial or by reducing the overall cost of ownership by putting the financial incentive directly on the hood. So those are the three main areas that um, funding will be um, directed to through the transportation package. And really how to get that passed is really working with your elected representatives. So just getting on that phone, emailing them and communicating your direct support and really sharing anecdotal experiences. Um, we do a lot of conversations with decision makers, policy makers, and they really wanna hear those anecdotal experiences from your communities on how this can make an impact or how not having access to these resources really impacts your lifestyle and your day-to-day -day access to, you know, doing your daily activities and whatnot. That's great, thank you so much. Uh, we have the next question from Matthew from Peninsula Clean Energy. Thanks for joining us tonight, Matthew. What kind of recommendations do you have for EV charging infrastructure payment systems that don't depend on credit debit, which we know is an issue in communities that are underserved? Sure, so one thing that is being explored, um, is, which is similar somewhat to our Clipper cards are having locations to load up a prepaid card. So filling that card with cash and then having a way to use that to a digital payment. So that is like the most common um, example that is being explored right now. Beyond that, I know there are some additional things that are being explored, but I think that is the best use case and most immediate use case um, for transitioning more equitable payment structures to EVSE. Great, thank you. And just a reminder for everyone, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. We're working our way through them now. This question is from Adam. To date, it looks like we are adopting a gas station in every garage model of EV charging, but with fast charging, this may be out of date. Home charging becomes a nice to have rather than a must have. Any thoughts about how fast charging can support EV penetration in underserved communities? By fast charging, I'm assuming you mean level three or level two. So level two definitely is um, an area that needs more attention in underserved communities. A lot of underserved community members live in multifamily housing. So with that, there needs to be a lot more funding specifically targeting multifamily housing. So I do know this uh, California Energy Commission is exploring grant opportunities to place funding or to place chargers at multifamily housing, which will then bridge level two charging to communities as such. Another area that really needs to be addressed is the level three, so the DC fast, which is the most accessible and most convenient in terms of charging. So that again is really working with partnerships. So looking at the EVSC owners, whether that's companies like EVGO or whatnot, and then also looking at um, policymakers, decision makers, and municipalities to really come together and look at innovative strategies to reduce you know, costs, look at cost sharing, and really just minimize the amount of administrative um, kind of details that go into deploying EBSE. Great, thank you. And I think that actually addressed a question further down too about multi-unit dwelling. So um, you may have covered two questions in one. Thank you for that answer. No problem. We have a question about the Clean Cars for All 
if someone has lost access to gas driven vehicles and have limited funds um, to get another car, is that program what is helpful for getting folks into vehicles? And that may be one of the ones that we've talked about um, in your prior slide about um, current funding not being clear. Sure. So with Clean Cars for All, that program requires trading in an eligible vehicle. And for the Bay Area program, that means you need to own a vehicle that's 2005 or older that's been used in California for the past two years. So if that person does no, does no longer has access to that vehicle, I'm assuming that means they no longer own it, they would not be able to participate in Clean Cars for All because it requires trading in a car. As such, I would recommend looking at the grant programs that are statewide, like the Clean Vehicle Assistance Program, and then trying to stack that with the Clean Vehicle Rebate Project. So those are open statewide and don't require trading in a car. And then depending where these people live, there also may be local incentives to stack and really bring down that overall cost of ownership. Great, thank you. And an extension of that is from Doran at the Climate Center. Hi, good to have you here tonight. Um, what are the prospects for refunding these programs and what can we all do to help make more funding available? Sure. So I know um, at least Bay Area Clean Cars for All just got its new funding source. So I believe they just reopened not too long ago. I also think a rep from that program is on the call if they <laughs> wanted to confirm in chat, more than welcome to. Um, a lot of the statewide programs, their participation rates are very high. With that, the funding gets expended very quickly. However, with that momentum of participation, there is the clear case that these programs are desired and that community members clearly want to continue to have access to these programs. CARB from conversations of what I know is continuing to you know, budget out funding for each of these programs. What CARB is looking to do is shifting more money into equity funded um, or equity related programs. So with that, just kind of bumping up the thresholds for funding specifically for equity centered programs or programs that have an equity kind of, um, I guess like a little equity offset in their program. Um, so with that, again, just really being um, involved in conversations at the policy level. So signing up to a uh, CARD's lip serve is one way of being informed of um, rulemaking decisions or proposed uh, changes to these programs and is a way that you can vocalize your sentiments about these programs and really state the case that you're in support of these programs and want to see funding to be continued to be diverted their way. Thank you. And I see that folks are really being active in the chat, even answering these questions as we're going, which is awesome. So let me catch up to myself. Um, Paul, I just asked Ariane to, to address your question um, in chat about leasing. Ariane is with the Carl Napco EV program at Actera, so she can address awesome. that. Awesome. you. Um, let's see, where's my next question? Great comments. Okay, from Maria, what's the best way to engage low to moderate income residents in disadvantaged polluted communities during outreach when the prices of the family-sized EVs they would need are so high? That is definitely um, a concern when navigating outreach and then just given the landscape of the EVs. So with that, um, just transparency is obviously in your best interest. You never want to set up a family or miscommunicate the services available to families, especially when they're financial resources like vehicle incentives. So just being very clear about what is available is very important when you're bridging community members to these programs and providing information about these programs. And then just sitting down with them and having thoughtful conversations and actually mapping out what finances look like. So if they're looking to stack incentives, laying out you know, a brief chart, looking at what those stacked incentives look like, and then the bottom line for what is not covered by those incentives. And then also with that, um, as you saw in a couple of slides ago, California is working to support the development of used EV markets. So with that, creating better partnerships with dealers to really get more used EV inventory on their lots so that families that have larger vehicle size needs beyond the you know five passenger sedan are able to go onto a lot and see used vehicles, especially since 
these larger vehicles are more recent in terms of the EV market, really hitting the market in the past couple of years, the EV space or the used EV space for these larger vehicles is minimal. So really having those intentional dealership partnerships to incentivize them to have used inventory on their lot is really important. So transparency is one piece. Um, really mapping out the incentives and understanding the incentive landscape is another piece. And then just having the market there to support it is, I think, the kind of third chunk. That's great. And I'm going to do a quick plug for some of Actera's programs that feed into that. Ariane, again, who's on the call, and Linda, who's on the call. Um, you can see Linda on camera. Hi, Linda. They are running our Carl Knapp OEV program. And one of the programs they um, have started in the last year is financial incentive clinics that support these communities that then feed into one-on-one -on -one consultations so that we can walk through rebates with individuals that have questions about these very things. Um, so if anyone is interested, please keep an eye out for the events calendar for Actera that has the financial incentive clinics that talk about these rebates, how to get through the rebate process, what is stacked, what's not, and then sign up for one of those one-on-one -on -one consultations if you're interested, because we do want to support people through that, um, what can be a very complicated process. So Vanessa, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, of course. One of the questions that's next is from Tim. And I, I, I again, want to plug Actera. Fund Actera. <laughs> there are nonprofits that take donations from individuals that are understood to be most effective at getting more EVs on the road with diversity, equity, and inclusion in mind. Um, definitely think of Actera, definitely think of EV Noir, but Vanessa, do you <laughs> Yeah, I was just about to say, definitely think of Actera, um, <laughs> our organization as well. Grid Alternatives is another great organization mm -hmm. in the Bay Area that is directly doing case management for vehicle incentive programs. And then also just does um, education outreach around clean mobility. They partner with Actera as well. Um, and then beyond that, um, there are some local community-based organizations. I can really speak to the ones in the East Bay since that has been my home for the past couple of years, but a really great one is the East Oakland Collective. Um, they work mm -hmm. directly with community members and they're really unique at looking at uh, micro-mobility options, multimodal. So not just EVs, but really looking at what are the specific mobility needs that can fit community members through Northern Oakland all the way down to East Oakland, which are very different communities. Um, so we'll plug those. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, we also have a comment um, from Matthew about L2 at multi-unit dwellings, raising concerns about additional utility service. I don't know if you want to address that um, comment. It's not, it's not really a question, but he's calling out that PCE has a strong focus on L1 solutions, um, which, you know, pay attention to the comments in the chat because they are adding quite a bit of context to this conversation. Not really a question, but definitely keep an eye on the comments. And then um, there is a comment from Linda about some work that uh, Actera has been supporting and Vanessa Warheit is on the line as well. Vanessa, you're raising your hand. Are you in a place where you, you want to mention this really quickly? If not, I can read the comment. Okay, we will assume the raised hand is an <laughs> So, um, if you would be willing to learn more about EV charging access for all, which is um, current policy that we are working to pass in the state of California, please send an email urging California to strengthen the proposed new Cal Green code. There's a link in the chat of a Google Doc that you can learn more from that provides a sample email and where to send yours. We are actively promoting policy that focuses on EV charging access. Um, calling it EV charging access for all because we believe in the, the importance of making sure folks have access to those charging. Um, okay, great, Vanessa's ready. Go for it, Vanessa. Can you hear me? Sorry, yeah. yep. I've had all yep. sorts of trouble getting online. Um, yes, well, just as you just said, we have um, a, a unique opportunity right now to influence the California building codes, which are currently not equitable at all. For the last six years, they have mandated that 100% of new single family homes um, provide charging access and a, a, just a tiny, tiny percentage, first 3%, then up to 10% of uh, multifamily housing, um, which is clearly not right. And um, we have been pushing them. We have succeeded in getting them to, to now provide 25% EV ready 
which is still not enough. Um, so we have a very easy, handy two minute action you can take. I will put the link um, if Linda doesn't beat me to it in the chat. Um, there it is. Uh, and actually there's an even easier one. Maybe Linda, we can give them the bit.ly link. Um, so it's easy to remember and um, write down because I wasn't able to copy things out of the chat earlier for some reason. Um, but anyway, yes, the comment period ends on September 27th. And our goal is to flood them with comments from people telling them that they need to make EV charging at home equitable for um, everyone because the cheapest time to install EV infrastructure is during new construction. So, um, and to Adam's earlier point um, about DC fast charging as a solution, that's a very expensive solution. And in some places, Vanessa's right, we're gonna need to um, have some sort of partnerships to ensure that it's affordable. But in the meantime, if they're building brand new parking for multifamily housing, they need to be making it accessible to the, making EV charging access accessible to the residents. Great. Vanessa, thank you so much for that um, quick call to action for us. So um, Vanessa Moreland, our speaker, we have you for four more minutes. I'm very curious um, what you would share to everyone today that is the thing weighing most on your heart. What is the thing you want us all to leave this conversation knowing and kind of feeling after our time together today? Sure. I think one thing that really hits home for me is I'm assuming a lot of you have ties to the Bay Area, whether that's with your friends, your family, or you know, being a Bay Area resident yourself. Try to shift the narrative to thinking of these e-mobility advancements to connecting your neighbors, your friends, your family to these technologies. And I think once you kind of start shifting in that lens, it really carries how pressing these activities are to be inclusive, diverse, and equitable. Um, for us to really hit these milestones, it's more than just numbers. You really need to understand that these are people's livelihoods at risk. These are people that are unfortunately not by choice, just disproportionately impacted by such um, disenfranchising, <laughs> isolating policies that have been around for such a long time. So with that, when you really humanize the experience, I think it just motivates us to collaboratively advance towards these milestones laid out both regionally and for the state. Such a good reminder, Vanessa, thank you. And what an amazing, powerful way to end our time together. We will make sure that we send out the recording to everyone who has registered. Tim, thank you, thank you. Good to see your face. Um, we had so many uh, recognizable names tonight and also so many new names. Please continue to join Actera in our events. We, we are um, a convening organization, so we would not be here without you. We're so grateful for your time and energy. Uh, Vanessa, thank you so much for taking your time this evening to share your work with us. We're really, really honored to be part of the EV Noir and EV Hybrid Noir community. Um, there's definitely a lot of overlap in our efforts and we're so grateful to you. Thank you, everyone. Please enjoy the rest of your Wednesday evening. Thank you all so much. It was a joy. Bye.